Right, good morning everybody to get another session of the Overberg Jewel of Jew Scientist Group. And today it is our pleasure to welcome Kate Clanons James, who is the daughter of the late John Vincent James, who I had the pleasure of working with on the very first project of mine in the Drakensberg Pump Storage Scheme. Now Kate matriculated in 1999 with a BA Honours in Archaeology from WITS in 2006. Worked at Saltas in 2006. She worked at Saltas Geotechnical as a geotechnical technician from 2000 until 2010. She's also the curator of the Geological Museum from June 2010. And in her spare time, she guides the Clips River Perk, Clips River Perk Nature Reserve from 1997 until 2010. She's married to Peter since 2018 with two kids. Kate's activities: she's an avid reader and enjoys PC gaming and spending time with her family. Otherwise, she enjoys collecting rocks and minerals, writing articles on history, sailing arts and crafts, including quilting and painting markets and socializing with her friends around home evenings. Over to you, Kate. Good morning. Good morning. Hope everyone can hear me. Okay, thank you for the introduction, Henny. This morning, I'm going to do a brief and yet unfinished history talk of the old south of Johannesburg. This is titled The Wrong Side of the Main Reef. I have to say a big thank you for the photograph on my on my first slide to my husband who took this photograph. It's a it's a long long shot of the night sky near Harry Smith. So it is a South African star photograph. I started this research because the Overberg group had asked me to do a talk on the history of Joburg and then I got completely sidetracked by looking south because all the talks in Johannesburg are done about the north. So from here we're going to start. My first slide is a slide showing the whole of Johannesburg. This is a map and you can see the line of the mine dumps. I'm going to use my mouse pointer to point out the line. There's the line of the mine dumps running here. The mine dumps are very, very clearly show the demarcation between the north of Joburg and the south of Joburg. You can see the north of Joburg, this area here, is very green, it's quite wooded, and it's very well developed. Whereas the south of Joburg, which is this area here, is not quite as green and very much not as well developed. And we want to look into the reasons why, and also the development of the south over the years. This is a planned map of the Johannesburg suburbs from 1897. This map, you can see this, this slightly red line over here. This marks the line of the main reef. Everything south of this main reef, this side, is the south of Joburg. And everything north is the area that most people talk about when they're talking about Joburg and most of the city limits. And in this map, you can also see the very clear demarcation between what was developed and what wasn't. This is just a close up of that map, again showing that red line, and that red line showing the reef. The reef from here dips south, and the reef daylights east to west. You can see also on this map the names of the mines that were placed just below that reef. So we've got Robinson Deep, we've got Worcester, Main Reef, Ferreira, Ferris Deep, Wimmer Deep, Salisbury, Jubilee, and Village, Main, and City and Suburban. These mines, most of them no longer exist, but Village Main Reef and Robinson and the Main Reef, reef section are now where we know of as Gold Reef City. This is just a, a viewed inside of that map. This shows the development of the south of Joburg at the time. On this map, you can see Casey's Township in the bottom and Turf Club. And that's where Turfentine today stands. Also, the Elo Plantation is now where Kenilworth stands. Rosettenville and La Rochelle are the same area. Boysons is in the same area and Overton is the same area. But all of the other blank areas have been very well developed since then. You can also see on, on this, this, this map where Dornfontein is up, up on the right-hand side. Dornfontein was the original suburb of Johannesburg. And it was classed as a very high-class suburb. But when the, the mines started coming in very heavily and the mine dumps started coming in, it started to get very dusty and dirty. So they, they, they became this, 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 this saying that the south is dirty, so the dirty south. So people started moving further north. And that's why so many of the, the higher class developments are further north on, on the Orange Grove Hills. 
So sometime between 1884 and 1886, gold was discovered in, in the Transvaal. And there are a lot of contradictory stories about who discovered it and where. Some people say it was found in Langlachter, some people it was at Vilgelstrasfontein, and others mentioned the Struben brothers and Vilgelspreit. But anyway, you look at it, gold was found and, and the city was proclaimed in 1886. And by 1896, there were over 100,000 people living in the area. This photograph shows the spot where George Walker supposedly discovered the main reef. And this is from a book called The Romance of the Golden Rand by, by W. MacDonald. This is a photograph of old Mr. Honeyball pointing at the hole in the main reef made by Mr. Walker at Longnacht in 1886. Apparently, he found it there. We're not sure. This is from the Rand Daily Mail archives. This was, this was from 19, 1933. This is a photograph of what early Johannesburg would have looked like. You can see there's not very much. There are a couple of tin houses and it's fairly empty and flat. There aren't very many trees. There's no big rivers. This is another photograph of early Johannesburg. You can see the tented camps. You can see again those tin houses and you can start to see the development of stone houses in the distance. You can also see the starting of the planting of trees around the properties. This photograph I really like. This is a photograph, it's a part of a panoramic photograph and it shows the first police station in Johannesburg. It's the little black building on the right-hand side and all the men in their white hats are the early, early, early police. On the left on the bottom is the Olympic. The Olympic was a bar and hotel. This photo was taken in 1888. So it was right at the beginning of Joburg. This is one of the very early mining houses. You can actually see the, the, tin, the tin shack and the shape. You can see it's got a, a, a brick stove on the right-hand side. This house probably only had one room, maybe a bedroom on the side. There wasn't very much to it, but it had a nice porch at the front. And this was sort of the standard housing at, at around the 1880s to 1890s. This is an early mining house. This is the beginnings of what the mining offices looked like. So you can see the shaft on the left-hand side. You can see the mining house and they probably, the family probably lived in that house and ran the office from that house. They'd also run a general store from the house and you know, the ubiquitous mining store. This is one of the early advancements in, in, in mining technology. It's bucket and winch system where you'd, you'd winch a person down and then back up again. I really like this photo merely because you can see how proud the men are just standing next to the bucket and winch and you can see how happy and sort of, they, they seem to have this air of, you know, we're doing something cool. All right, <laughs> this, this is a tourist map showing early Johannesburg. This map was probably created around 1930. And what's interesting about this map is it very, very show, clearly shows just how quickly and how dense the northern suburbs developed, whereas the southern suburbs were still very underdeveloped. I'm going to go to the next slide. The next slide is just a zoomed in version of the same map showing the southern suburbs. And you can see here there's not very much going on. You can see the line of where the mines are. You can actually see this, would, this where my mouse pointer is, is Main Reef Road over there up there and you can see there's not a not a great deal going on you can see there's a couple of mines there's a couple of mining spaces there's the railway line but otherwise in terms of tourism in the south there was Wimmerpan Pioneer Park and the race course and that was absolutely it there's very much very little else but if you come to the bottom here I'm going to move my mouse pointer this is Rifle Range Road which is now roughly in the middle of the south and Rifle Range Road marked the edge of what was then considered the, the city these are a couple of, of postcards showing some of these early mines. This is Village Main Reef. This is one of the, the more no northern mines. It's around where Gold Reef City stands today. And these big wheels are quite important because, and this next slide, they were part of the, the cyanide process which saved Johannesburg and saved the early mining. Unfortunately, because of the, the early ways of extracting gold, some of the, the, the more dense gold reef, the deeper gold reef, you couldn't get the gold out. So two very clever Scotsmen discovered the cyanide process 
and it was imported to South Africa and then used extensively and it saved the entire mining business. This is another postcard. This is showing Village Deep. Village Deep is slightly more to the east of, of the main city deep mines. And it just shows what these mining areas would have looked like in the early 1900s. This is one of the five stamp mills. It was, it's called a five stamp because there are five stamps on each battery. There are lots of stories about who bought the first stamp mill onto the Rand. And there are stories about earlier ones and later ones. This particular one was the first stamp mill bought onto the, the main Rand. And it was brought by a gentleman called Sam Wem Wemmer in 1887. His wife, Martha Helena, was also the first woman who was supposedly resident on the Rand. She moved up from Kimberley in 1886. Wemmer Pan, which is a fairly famous wet spot in the South, is named for Sam Wemmer. You can see this particular stamp battery at the Clerfendal Nature Reserve where it's been restored. And the battery, like I said, this particular stamp battery arrived here in 1885, but was probably only put onto the, onto the main reef in 1887. The stamp battery was also the stamp battery that used to be at the bottom of the Standard Bank building in town. This is a photograph of Wemmerpan, which is what we were talking about. We're now going to get into the suburbs of the south. Wemmerpan looks over a suburb called La Rochelle. You can see the houses in the distance. That's what La Rochelle would have looked like. Wemmerpan is now unfortunately unusable, but it was a sporting ground and there was decent sailing there. La Rochelle as a suburb was declared in 1895 and it was named for the town of La Rochelle by its developer. La Rochelle also has the rather dubious but great honor of hosting the, the hot rod races at the Wembley Stadium. Hot rodding was a very, very sort of hot and happening sport at the time. But the hot rod races were a Friday night event, but they only lasted for six months of the year. In the other six months, the speedway was covered over, the tar was taken off, and it was filled with gravel, and it was used as speedway racing, which is bike racing. The speedway was bought, bought to Wembley by Buddy Fuller in 1948. Before this, it was held at an area called the Old Barn in Alberton. These photos were given to me by Brian Dawson, and they, they, they're quite a good indication of what the hot rodding was like. This is one of the La Rochelle absolute musts. This is Restaurant La Perenia. It's built on what was the old Sixth Street lockup. It wasn't a police station. What it was was a jailhouse. And if you do visit, the courtyard, kitchen, and side rooms are the, are the original charge office and lockup. The restaurant was bought in, in, and started in July 1975 and is still running today. The food is really good. All right, so we're going to move across to the next suburb along. I'm not moving in particularly geographical. It's merely the pictures that are, um, amused me suburbs. This is a photograph of early Boysons. This is the Boysons area looking north in about 1890. Boysons, the suburb itself, was only laid out in 1897. So you can see there's not very much here. It's just empty felt and you can see the town there in the distance. Mm -hmm. This is the same area. This is in 1908. And you can see on the right hand side that that building with the that sort of Cape Dutchy tops is the Boysons Hotel itself. The hotel itself was, was built in 1893 and it was originally a stop for the Zederberg coach, which is the coach that brought miners up from Kimberley to the Rand. And the Zetterberg coach itself is actually standing in Museum Africa. The Boysons Hotel, other claim to fame in terms of miners was that the miners tried to take, take over the hotel in the 1922 miners strike. You can also see in this picture, you see the tramway coming up, but you can see most of the transport was still horse and carriage. Some of the buildings in the background are actually still there in Boysons, although they've been improved and made taller, adjusted, but the bones of those buildings are still visible. This is a painting of the same area. This is in 1933. The hotel itself was owned by SAB until 1977, where it was bought by Mr. Berenbau. In this photograph, you can see the tramway and you can see there's been more development behind the hotel. You can also see the trees have grown up a bit. This is the same hotel again in 1967. You can see it's had an extra extra story added to it. You can look at the old cars as well, which are quite cool. 
Voisin's Hotel unfortunately burnt almost to the ground on the 6th of May of 2003. The fire started at 2 a.m. in the kitchen. The roof on the on the western side caved in and the restaurant in the hotel had been completely gutted, but none of the occupants were seriously injured. This is a floor plan of that original hotel, the one we've just seen. After the fire, the hotel was re rebuilt and re-established and still stands today. And it is known as one as being one of the oldest still usable establishments in Johannesburg. Also in Boysons, and this one is, is fairly interesting if you're a gardener, was an area called the Nelson's Nurseries. Nelson's Nurseries was a very large area that was run by a man called Mr. Nelson, obviously. And Mr. Nelson in about 1895 was growing 90% of the trees and plants used for greening up the rest of Joburg. So if you look on this, this is the, the previous one, the map that we saw earlier, just on, I'm going to use my mouse point again, just on this side here, it says plantation and agriculture. This is the area here where the Nelson's nurseries would have been. Most of Kempton Park is treed by plants that were grown in Nelson's nurseries. This is just another map, just giving you an idea of just how big the Nelson's nurseries area was. So you can see there's Boysons over here, you can see Turfentine's estates, and you can see just the sheer size of where Nelson's nurseries was. This is a photograph showing Turfentine. This is about 1910. Turfentine itself became a suburb in 1886. This just gives you an idea of what the landscape in Turfentine and the surrounding areas would have looked like. Again, looking at this, this, this old map, you can see the Turfentine suburb and the layout of Turfentine. Turfentine was originally laid out and designed as a, an upmarket suburb and laid out in a way that would appeal to, to people, especially the British coming through. So you can see there's Rotunda Park and Christopherson Park that was wide streetways and lots of parks around. Unfortunately, because of the dust and the dirty South reputation, the, air, the area was um, not selling well to the upper class. So they halved the size of the lots and they, they dropped, dropped the price of buying a lot to hopefully attract the blue collar workers and the artisans, which is exactly what happened. These are a couple of photographs from 1910 showing early turpentine houses. Most of these houses still are still around and look fairly similar. All of the houses were, were inhabited by artisans and their families, and they tended to have fairly large families. You can see they all have the deep porches and the, and the sort of comfortable South African look. You can also see a classic family life scene on the right-hand side. These are a collection of photos from a, a lady called Eileen. Eileen was born in, in Turfentine, and these photographs show pictures of her growing up in, in a the house she grew up in Donnelly Street in Turpentine on the left hand side and on the right hand side you can see a photograph of her playing in the just outside on the pavement outside her grandmother's house in Leonard Street. Eileen was born in 1939 so these are a little bit shortly after and you can see just how small the lots and the houses were and how many of the houses in Turpentine are the these these shared lots there the, the semi-detached and detached houses. Of course, you can't talk, talk about Turfentine at all without talking about the Turfentine race course. In 1889, the Johannesburg Turf Club leased the land that held the Johannesburg handicap. And in December of the year, they held the, that, that Johannesburg handicap. They also built a temporary paddock and they intended to keep it as a race horse, race course. Before this, all the races were held on a flat track in Ferreira's camp. They actually bought the land in 1892 and began the construction of what we know as Turfentine Racecourse today. This is just a couple of photographs from around the early 1910s, just showing some of the race goers, the auction site, the paddock and the ring. And also this wonderful, the, the wonderful pavilion area there. There's another series of those, those photographs. The original large grandstands were built in 1891 and then revamped in 1970. You can see again the, the fashions, you can see how everyone dressed up to the nines just to, to, to be at these races to make themselves seen. 
This is a photograph of the, ra the race course in 1887. You can see it's a very, very busy area and you can see the original temporary grandstand that was built. There was a, a rather interesting quip that I heard from Flo Bird about the Jamison Raid and the Turfentine race course. The Turfentine race course was, of course, involved in the Jamison Raid, but her quip did when the Jamison Raid didn't go as planned because all the eight Londoners were actually at the racing, which I thought was rather funny because it's not entirely false. This is again, this is just a really dapper fellow at the races. You can see the absolute fashion there. I can't imagine how his wife must have felt having to wipe, wash that white outfit, especially as it gets really dusty. But you have to love the fashion and the pose. And it's very much a case of we're going to stand here and look as pretty as possible. Another rather interesting building in Turfentine is the Turfentine Fire Station. This is a photograph from 1910 showing the front of the fire station with the horse-drawn horse fire cart. To the right of this photograph, there would have originally been two gum trees. And there was an article in the Heritage Portal talking about these gum trees. They were originally used at the lookout po posts for spotting fires. The gum trees had a plank in between them and the firemen would climb up and look around. Unfortunately, you could also see the Turfentine racetrack from the top of these posts. So these firemen would then signal into Central Joburg who had won the race, and the Central Joburg punters would then bet on the race. They eventually figured it out, and the Turfentine race course demanded that the trees be cut down. But they were replanted again, just in memoriam. This is the same fire station. This was last weekend, so this is 2022. The fire station building is still there. You can see it there in the foreground. You can also see the two gum trees on the right-hand side. Those are not the original gum trees as the ones that were planted later. The working fire station is behind this fire station. You can see the flagpoles in the background and it's quite a lot larger and far more modern building, but they've kept this as an admin block and you can still visit from time to time. We have to also talk about churches in the area. This is a painting of the Presbyterian Church on Tramway Street. This painting is done by Battis and hangs in the house of Brian Dawson. Tramway Street was historically laid out as part of the original Turfentine. It was laid out to accommodate trams, but it was never used to accommodate trams. But it retained all of the same, it retained the name and retained the same, same air. And if you walk down the street, you can see it's a very mixed, a wide mixture of, of architecture. There's a mixture of large old courts, old flats, old, old use mixed buildings, residential buildings. And some of the buildings have really, really changed. So you can go and you could actually see some of the old buildings and the bones of the old buildings. This is the original Presbyterian church. It was changed later on. So the next picture will show you that change. This is a photograph taken in 2022. You can see how the front of the church has changed, but you can see it retained that old tower. Next to the church on the left-hand side is the manse. So this would have been the house of the pastor that lived in the church. And you can see there isn't a wall between the church and the manse. There used to be a chain link fence, but Brian Dawson and his family removed the fence. So the manse at that moment is, is occupied. The lady who cleans the church lives there. The church itself is flagging a bit, but mostly because a lot of the congregation has moved on. This is an interior of that church. This photograph was taken by my grandmother at my mom and dad's wedding of the photographs of, of the, the flowers to have photographs and records of them. But it serves as a very good record of what the interior of the church looked like. Unfortunately, because the photograph was taken in 1979, it has faded a bit and gone red, but it does show the lovely seating and, of course, the, back, the backdrop and the pulpit. This is a photograph of Brian Dawson's first car. Brian Dawson's father was the pastor at this church, and he did live in the area. This is in Austin, Cambridge, and it's parked in the driveway of the manse of the, ter of the Turpentine Presbyterian. So in the previous photo where, well, the photo before that, where we saw this outside of the church with the driveway gates, this would have been that driveway. You can see just how narrow these driveways were. It's a good car as well. Of course, if we're going to talk about Turfentine, we have to talk about some of their famous residents. The most famous probably being Daisy Demelka. She was born in 18, 
86 and she trained as a nurse. She married a man called William Cowell in 1909. He was a plumber for the municipality and they lived at a house in Turfentine, number 22 Tully Street from 1909 to 1922. There is a Durburg tour of Turfentine which takes you to a white house that says it's hers. That, ho that house is however not the house that they lived in. She had five children with William only one of whom su who survived. She, however, murdered William and her second husband with strychnine, and then later on murdered the surviving son with arsenic. And she was caught because of the murder of her son, because one of her relatives thought it was suspicious that he got sick. It was later discovered that she bought the arsenic in Turfentine at one of the local chemists, but she used her second married name to do so so that they wouldn't be able to trace her because they knew her by her older married name in Turfentine. She was hung for the murders in 1932. This is the house that she lived in number 22 Tully Street. You can see it is white. It retains its original shape and design. However, the roof has been changed. It's now tile instead of tin. It does look like a very nice house and it's a very pleasant street. Of course, another famous person who lived in turf and tea with Dale Laces. Josie Dale Lace, also known by her proper name was Josephine Cornelia Brink, was born in Richmond in the Karoo. She was a great, great socialite in Johannesburg, but she was also in London. And she was trying to be an actress. She married John Dale Lace twice. First, the first time she married, she didn't want to fall pregnant, so they divorced. And the second time she married, she decided it was a good idea after having another marriage proposal rejected. These are just a couple of photographs of her. You can see she was known as a beauty and she was very, very fabulous. She was also extremely eccentric. She really enjoyed doing the, the, the odd and the intriguing. So she had a zebra drawn carriage absolute flamboyance they used to drive around Johannesburg with it the only other people who have ever done this were in America but zebra drawn carriages didn't really sort of stick mostly because zebras are very hard to tame this is the house that was built by the Dale Laces by Herbert Baker in 1904 it's called Northwood Mansion Dale Lace was a, a, a Kimberley landlord rather than a gold landlord so he made his fortune in diamond mining but the Boer War and the depressed market meant that he lost a lot of his fortune. Josie's absolute hedonistic lifestyle didn't help either. And they began to lose a lot of their money. In 1911, a kitchen fire in the, the mansion gutted the entire mansion and meant basically ensured the, the complete loss of their fortune. They met, then moved to a farm called Boschkop, which is fairly famous as well, and returned to England for World War I. But they liked Johannesburg too much, so they came back in 1922, and they bought a where they bought a, a, a modest two-bedroom house in Kenilworth. And Josie opened up an upmarket dress shop. This is the two-bedroom house in Ferrera Street in Kenilworth. It retains the same shape and style, however, the colouring is a little bit um, jarring. It is now a early education centre. But it does still stand, and Josie would probably recognize it if she walked past it. One of the other great institutions in the South is the Turfentine Government School. This school is quite important because it founded a lot of the schools in the South of Joburg. Turfentine Primary, as we know it, was started in 19, was this, this one was built in 1914, but it was started in 19, 1902 in a tent on Hay Street with 102 pupils. Because the tent got too small quite quickly, a zinc and wooden building replaced the tent. And then in 1910, this building was built to replace that wooden building. A school is still around today and that building is still there. This is 2022. This photograph was taken again by myself and Peter. This is just showing that the classrooms, that building that we saw would have been on the left side of that photograph. And the right hand photograph shows the Kubota's class in the pre-primary. My husband, Peter, was there for his Kubota's and for grade two, grade one and two. The Kubota's class, I'm going to use my mouse pointer again, I'm sorry, were these classrooms here on the on the left hand side with the red and the, the playground was the quad next to those and the, this grass area in front. 
the grade one and two are on the opposite side of that quad and this building to the front this one here was used as the admin block in the doctor's offices there are two trees that stand in the in the in the quad on the opposite side and those two trees were planted in the when the original 9010 building was built and the original flagpole was donated by the chamber of mines this is the turpentine bowls club the turpentine bowls club was originally opened in december 1916 and the gentleman bowling over there is the mayor at the time casting the first bowl on the green this club is still there and looks like this today. You can visit it. You can see the building retains its, its original shape and you can see the bowl, the bowl's green itself is the same bowl's green. Next to the Turfentine Bowls Club, however, is the Herbert Park Bowls Club. The Herbert Park, Park Bowls Club has two greens, a fairly nice restaurant which sells some very good food and also hosted the Dutch Bridge Club and the Dutch community for a very long time. The Herbert Park Bowl, Park Bowls Club also hosts the southern suburb Moth Shell Hole. Unfortunately, the shell hole is no longer in use as most of the people have, have moved on. But you can visit it and it has this small memorial. This is a photograph of Turfentine in 1934, just showing the stream and looking up into the into the, the ton itself, if you want to call it. You can see there wasn't very much development at all, even into the 30s. This is a photograph of Rosettenville in 1904. Well, it's a painting of Rosettenville in 1904. And you can see it is a peri-urban area. You can see some of the tree planting. You can see the early houses. Rosettenville was founded by a gentleman called, Le called Levine Rosenstein. He started buying stands in the area in 1889. And all the street names in the area are named for names of his family and flowers. The insert picture shows a picture of him himself he called himself Leo as opposed to Levin and his daughter Mabel. There is a Victoria Street near Zettenville and contrary to popular belief it's not named for the Queen, Queen Victoria but rather for Leo's wife who was a Victoria. Between 1924 and 1972 over 50,000 white Portuguese speaking immigrants moved into the area. And this led to, of course, one of the most famous Rosettenville imports and exports, which is, of course, Nando's. This is a photograph of the current photograph of the first Nando's restaurant. It was originally opened in 1987. The corner shop was originally built by Mr. John Cowie, who had owned the site since 1913. Years later, Fernando Duarte discovered a, a rather most delicious chicken in a dingy cafe and traded it for his site. He then persuaded his friend to taste it, and together they bought the building and the business and launched the first Nando's. And they named it after Dwight's firstborn son. It has gone on to introduce peri peri chicken and South African flavor to the rest of the world. Holy Trinity Church also stands in Rosettenville, and Holy Trinity Church and St. Peter's Priory led to one of the more famous schools in South Africa. On the left hand side, you can see the rather dingy photo of that small church that was Holy Trinity Church. It was originally part of the city and suburban mine and was moved in its entirety, the entire building was moved to Rosettenville. And now, and it, it, where it stands in this photo is now where the school bell stands at St. Martin's. The top photograph with all the girls is a photograph of the school of St. Agnes's. St. Agnes's was one of the first, the earliest schools started in the area, and it was a school for training domestic workers and native girls. It stood on the site from 1907, which is about the same time that St. Peter's Priory started out as a school, as a missionary school for boys. The Brick Priory and College were open in 1911, and the sketch at the bottom is a bird's eye sketch of what the Priory was going to look like. Right. This is current photographs of, of St. Martin's School and St. Peter, St. Peter's Priory. The photograph on the bottom is that showing the actual the, the church, the Priory itself. The Priory itself still stands and is still in use. Mm -hmm. And it hosted many notables, including R. R. Tambo and Hugh Mike Masekela in the missionary school. Unfortunately, it was forcibly closed in 1956 by the apartheid government due to the fact that having a missionary school in the middle of a predominantly white area was a little bit of a problem at the time. 
It was closed and it moved to the Eastern Cape in 1962, where it became part of the, the development of the Forte University. St. Martin's now is, is a, a thriving mixed race school, but it was an, opened as a white school and boarding, boarding school in 1958. Another fairly famous school in the south, and this one started with, with the Turfentine complex we, we mentioned earlier with Turfentine Primary, is Sir John Adamson. This is a photograph of Sir John Ad Adamson building off Rotunda Park in 1950. Sir John moved to the ridge that it's on at the moment in 1959. And Sir John and Forest Hill were the only white English schools in the south. So most of the, the, the white English descendant Southerners attended one of these two schools. If you were Afrikaans or an immigrant, you were forced to attend Fuckle, which is one of the oldest Afrikaans schools in the South. This is a photograph of the Sir John Adamson matric class of 1970. This photograph was provided by Brian Dawson. And you can see the sort of school kids really haven't changed all that much. They still look like a naughty set. The Sir John Old Boys group is incredibly active and they're very, very eager, eager to chat. They're also still at the current school grounds, which were procured in 1955, and the school was officially opened in 1959. We're now going to move down the ridge to one of the newer suburbs in, in Johannesburg South. This is a photograph of the Mondior area, it's a peri urban area from 1920. You can see they're still plowing the fields with oxen. You see there's a small number of, of farmsteads in the background. This is a very famous painting of the Mondial area done in 1948 by W. Kutzer. You can see there's a kippersol on the left hand side. This is very, very indicative of the area. There are still lots of kippersols growing. And you can see some of the roadways of the original layout of the area. This is a newspaper article talking about that painting. This is from May 1972. W. Kutzer was a, an old Johannesburg boy. He went to the, to the Boysons Government School, which is also in the South, and then to the Johannesburg Trade School. He learned how to be a furniture maker at the trade school, but his real passion was painting, and he became a payment became a great painter, especially of Boer culture, and he was asked to do some of the paintings at the Voortrekker Monument. This is one of the original sale plans for the Mondio Township. The Mondio Township was originally on the farm, or Mondi, hence the name Mondio is just a, a movement of the letters to create Mondio. The sale plan shows some of the original housing in the original street plan. The red, the red squares on this house show the houses that have been sold, and the white ones are the, are the plots that haven't quite been bought yet. You can see on this one the main road also running through is Columbine Avenue. Columbine Avenue is still the main road today. And unfortunately, because the area was peri-urban, none of the roadways were tarred or maintained, and the city didn't provide any of the services that you would normally have. So the earlier residents didn't have electricity or, or water or, or any of the amenities we believe in. They also didn't have a bus service. So they hired a driver called Jimmy Lee, and he drove the Mondial bus. The Columbine Avenue, which was on the main avenue in and out, of Mondial ran up through Mondial up, up to where Forest Hill now stands, but it didn't go the way it does now up Clip River, it went straight up the side of the hill. So whenever it rained, this dirt track would turn into an absolute disaster. And you'd either have to walk or sort of judge whether or not you felt it was safe to drive in a, a bus going up this very, very steep and rather muddy slope. They did move the road later on so that there wasn't quite as much as the slope to roughly where Columbine Avenue joins Clip River today. And there are stories about trenching on, on that road to stop the, the road racers coming in and making a mess of things. And there are also stories of people having accidents on the road due to not knowing about the trenches. Jimmy Lee fortunately retired, but when he did retire, his widow decided that she wasn't going to stand for this and bought a property just across from, from Clip River. 
and she called it the Leeways Nursery. The Leeways nurse, Nursery is still there, the original spacing is still there, but it's now called the Tulip Center. Early Mondio also had a, a problem with meeting places. Originally, they were meeting in somebody's house, and then they decided they needed a community meeting place, so they built a log cabin. Unfortunately, the log cabin is no longer there. However, on the top photograph of that building is the rec center on the tennis courts, and that stands where the original log, log cabin stood. Next to that is the scout hall, in Mondio, it's the Mondio Sea Scouts. Unfortunately, due to the COVID, they haven't been used a great deal. These, the, the photographs and information provided to me about Mondio were provided to me by a gentleman called Noel and his wife, Joan. Noel and Joan were, told me stories about Mondio. Noel had the seventh house built in Mondio and his wife had was the was lived in the first double story house that was built in Mondio. And he told me about the old wooden hut and how the Mondio developed. Nolan Jones wedding reception was held in the wooden hut. The wooden hut also served as the, the church meeting area, the meeting for town, town groups, the scout meeting hall, also for films, plays and general recreation. If you want to talk about the South of Joba, you also have to mention the Boer War. And we looked at Turfentine Racecourse earlier. Turfentine Racecourse was used as a concentration camp during the Boer War. And there were supposedly only 704 recorded deaths at the camp. The camp, however, whole, housed over 5,000 people, mostly women and children. It was, however, also known as one of the better camps in Joburg mostly because the women were housed in the old pavilion and there was space and decent sanitation. The memorial itself stands in Seder Ort and has a, this wagon and, and gravestone area listing the names of the people who died in the camp. Mondio also houses one of the entrances to the Clipperfierce Back Nature Reserve. The Clipperfierce Back Nature Reserve, although it was planned very early on, only became a reality after 1984. And you can see these newspaper articles talking about the planning in the Nature Reserve, and also one talking about how the Nature Reserve was finally fenced. This is an, a map from 1984 showing the extent of the Nature Reserve in relation to Mondio and Sederud. The nature reserve itself still stands and is still available, but you can see on this map, there was a concession granted by Witz up on the top there. There was also a concession further down, which, which was part of the old Marais farmstead. An area just where it says Sederud on this map was swapped for the area across Tip River Drive so that the, the nature reserve could be extended out and because the Nature Reserve owned the area across Clip River Drive, it made sense to amalgamate rather than to separate the area. This Nature Reserve hosts a couple of historically interesting places. This is a photograph of the Fierfontein Dam. Early Johannesburg didn't have a river. Unfortunately, this meant that there was a small problem in terms of getting water for the city. So one of the one of the plans was hatched by Barney Bonato, who bought up a great deal of the areas and amenities in the area, mostly because the gold, the landlords were trying to deny him access to the gold mining rights. He did manage to get hold of one set of gold mining rights and started to mine near Primrose. But one of the rights he did buy, buy was the water rights for the city of Joburg. So he was desperately trying to find a way to provide clean drinking water to Joburg. So he came up with the plan for the Fierfontein Dam. This dam would have sit where Silent Pool is now, and you can see the blocks, the block work there. The block work is all from conglomerates from the opposite side of the Mondial Valley. This is an old photograph. This is showing the workings at the, Mon at, at the Fierfontein Dam. The dam, however, failed mostly because where these two gentlemen are standing in the front, there was a large fault. So they fail failed to find a proper basement for the dam and they couldn't build a decent foundation. But you can see that in laying the rock work and you can see in the background something called a blonden crane. If this dam had gone through the Mondio Valley as we know it today would have been a dam, which probably would have you know, decreased property rates but increased the sailing. 
I was asked last night what a blondin crane was. So I drew a little sketch to try and explain the blondin crane. So what they would have done is they would have brought the blocks across the valley. So you can see on the left hand side, the blocks in the storage area. These would have been attached to a cable way that would have run across the valley. This would have been a taut rope. And this would have been a material ropeway and it would have incorporated a mechanism to raise and lower loads. So you can see my mechanism, I drew a double mechanism, it could have been a single one. So the, the, ro the, the, the stone would have been connected to the mechanism and using oxen, my oxen are not particularly fantastically drawn, they would have raised it up and then moved it to, to where it needed to be placed and lowered it down again. Hopefully the sketch makes sense. Blondin cranes were named after a type tight rope walker called Charles Blondin, who used a similar contra contraption to walk across Niagara Falls. Also in the nature reserve is the re remains of the Murray farmstead. The Murrays were one of the original farmers in the area, and the farmstead was bought by a family called Quilliam. The Quilliams lived there for an incredibly long time, and one of the, the Quil Quilliam descendants, Margaret, lives in the area. The top photograph is a photograph of the ruins of the farmstead. That photograph was probably taken about 2017. And the bottom painting is a painting of what the farmstead and stable yard would have looked like. It is visi visitable if you go into the entrance precinct into the nature reserve from Kibler Park. This is a photograph of the nature reserve from Kibler Park. It gives a very good indication of what the area would have looked like in terms of greenery. You can see it's sort of high felt grassland and you've got the fairly densely wooded, wooded slopes of the hills. It's very pretty and very, very, very pleasant. The, the Mondor hills are all based on Fentersdorp lava and you can see here this is a photograph of a toddler modeling an outcropping and you can see on the right hand side the toddler using his shoe for scale for that outcropping. This particular photograph shows, oh, hang on we haven't got another one, this one shows the phenocrysts and the amygdales at the top of this lava flow because the Fentersdorp lava is all, all, all basalt the flows came, came well not quite thick and fast but fast enough that these some of these these rocks are fairly bubbly, and this particular rock is very bubbly. It also shows a nice green lichen. I couldn't go through everything because else this talk would be incredibly long. So there are some honourable mentions. One of the earliest areas of the south of Joburg was Overton. Overton, however, was converted into industrial area. The top two photographs are some of the older photographs of the area. These were taken in the 1940s. The one on the left is showing the old Overton synagogue, which was unfortunately demolished in 1946. The one on the right shows a fairly standard shop front from the Overton area. And the one at the bottom shows a current photo of some of these shops. A lot of the shop fronts in the buildings still remain. They're not the same shop. However, I do believe the shop front from the older photo does still exist. You can visit the area, but it's like I said, it's an industrial area. So there aren't that very, very many of those original houses left. Mm -hmm. Another honorable mention has to be St. Patrick's Catholic Church, which is in La Rochelle. I didn't talk about St. Patrick's because there is a very large amount of history about it. And I didn't feel like a dirt justice. A joint to St. Patrick's is what used to be the St. Rose's convent. The convent was one of the earliest schools in the South. And unfortunately, when it, it was forced to close, the school children mo were moved across to another great Southern institution in Lynn Mayer called the Merritt's Brothers. Again, I just don't have the time to talk about all of them. And hopefully we'll be able to do another talk later to talk about these institutions. We also have to talk about early Mulbarton, Glenvista and Glenanda. These are a couple of early family photographs, just showing how the area wasn't developed. These are from about 1984, and it's showing how the roadways were still, still sort of sand, and just showing how there weren't all the, all the houses, it wasn't so built over, and how the area has changed. The one on the right, this one was the two small kids, the, small kid smiling at the camera is me, which is how I know I can date it, shows the grading of the roads in Mulbarton for tarring. I remember this particularly well and I remember the smell. Mm -hmm. I do have to thank some of my contributors. 
This is a photograph of Brian Dawson. He was born in 1953 and lived in Turpentine from 1962 until 1977. As previously mentioned, his father was the minister at the St. John's Presbyterian Church in Turpentine, which we saw photographs of earlier. He also provided photographs of the hot rods. He was a, a scout in Turpentine in the, in the first southern suburb scouts for a very long time, and he provided me a huge amount of information and photographs about the area. I do hope to do a scouting talk later on. This is Noel and Joan Thornton. Noel and Joan were some of the earliest residents in Mondial. They lived, Noel lived in Mondial from 1948. And as I mentioned earlier, Joan lived in Mondial from 1951, where she had the first double story house. They gave me a lot of the information about Mondial and most of the older photographs are scans from Joan's Mondial file. This is Eileen. Eileen was born in Turfentine in 1939. And she moved around Turfentine a bit and then about around the southern suburbs. Eileen and her daughter Kay gave me a huge amount of information about not only the speedway and the southern suburbs, but also how the south has changed. Eileen agreed to do a second interview with me because the first six hour interview didn't cover nearly as much as we wanted to. This is Rue Allen Lindsay. Rue Allen Lindsay was born in 1933, but moved to Milbarton in 1979, where he took over being a nurseryman at the Southern Suburbs Nursery. He gave me an awful lot of information about the early Southern Suburbs, especially the Glen Vista, Glen Andal, Milbarton area. He also provided a lot of the plants that, that decorate those gardens now. He was incredibly interesting to talk to, especially about the planting and the landscaping of the South. This, of course, is my darling husband, Peter. Peter took a lot of the, the modern photographs that we've seen today. He also moved to Turpentine in 1991. So while we were driving around, he was regaling me with stories about growing up in the area. They were very interesting stories, and I have told you some of them here. Other people we have to mention is Linda James, my mom, for letting me raid her photo store. Museum Africa for employing me and allowing me to talk. Henny Hreff and the Overberg Society. Sorry, I didn't add the extra F. Right? Henny, I know I had to. He, they allowed me to do the talk. The ladies from Letitia's Dance Studio who have been feeding me tippets and, and spreading the word about me wanting to talk to people. Mornay Britt, who was involved in the clip of years back and provided me quite a lot of information. Natalie and Elizabeth Wildman for providing me information about Rosettenville and St. St. Martin's. Calvin James Montgomery, who is a historian in the area and has provided me quite a lot of information and has agreed to help me get more information about some of the churches in the area. Flo Bird and the Heritage Foundation for some of the more amusing clips I've heard about the South, also for allowing, allowing me to raid their, their archive. So thank you very much. Thank you very, very much for listening to my talk. I hope I didn't talk too fast. And thank you for having me, and I hope that you enjoyed it. Thank you, guys. Now time for questions. Oh dear, questions. So feel free to text them or, talk, or just come online, put your camera on and your mic and or your hand up and just ask Kate any questions. Remarkable control you had over that cursor of yours. Um, <laughs> for a change. I did well. <laughs> yeah. I have a question. Yes. My name is Gavin Self. Um, Case, apparently the Zetterberg coach line used zebras for a while. It was the coach line that ran all the way from Polokwane to um, the old coach house and down to the late Storp um, yes. gold fields in, in Popo. So everybody seemed to have experimented with zebras and coaches for a while, but then got over it and went back to the donkeys and the horses. Uh, part of the issue with with zebras is you can't you can't tame them the same way you can tame horses and donkeys so you have to hand rear them so while they may have experimented with them it isn't really a feasible way of of raising um transport stock they're also not particularly happy to be ridden with a saddle so while you can use them as coach horses they don't actually like it very much so i think a, a great number of people tried it including the rothschilds in america but most people just have stopped you do quite often get um 
instances of zoses, especially where you have um, horses and zebras living in close proximity. And zoses can actually be ridden and trained very much the same way that a horse can. Okay. Andrew says question. he would like to talk to you regarding scouting in the south of Japan. love to talk so to you, Andrew. You will be in touch. Yeah. And uh, Nolan says, for somebody who's lived in Joburg, she hasn't seen a fraction of the city. So very well done, Kate. Well, part, part of the big problem with Joburg South is there isn't a lot of history written about it. So you won't find any books or fancy sort of tabletop photographs. So most of the, the history of the South is oral, which is why I've been interviewing people because you just, yeah. you can't find that history. And a lot of the photographs, they're really important photographs, have to be found in, in the in yeah. people's personal photograph archives. So, and you mentioned of the Blondin crane, they actually yeah. used one with the construction of the Katsi Dam. So there is a modern day application of yeah. not using oxen, but using the okay. system. I have to ask Kenny, did you like my drawing? Yes, specifically the meat that you had in there. <laughs> All right. I, I saw a question at the bottom from Peter about the naming of turpentine. Uh, turpentine, the reason it's called turpentine, it was originally because there was a fountain and it was a, a clay area and a clay fountain. So it's not turf as in we think as, as in the English word turf. It's actually from the Afrikaans turf. Is it still running today, turpentine? Turf, turpentine race course still runs. Yes, it's very active. They have a, a, a lot of the, the meats are still going. And you can still actually go up there. They've got a couple of really nice restaurants as well. I didn't get any photographs of modern day turpentine merely because I didn't want to try and get in and take photographs of the lounge, of the of the, the lounges and the buildings. I'd have to actually go in on a race day and I didn't have a chance to do that. But you can actually go in and see turpentine as it is, but you can also go and visit the fire station and all of the other places I've spoken about. And Kate, I see you were a dasher from way back when you were a little girl sitting on the wall. Huh? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> that, that photo, my, my, I think my mom took that photo. Okay. But it, 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 it's, it's only pertinent because it's the grader in the background. Otherwise, I wouldn't have used it. And, you and Tom, I mean, you, sorry, Eddie, I mean, you've done all this work now, you and Peter, and taken you know modern photographs as well. Is, is it sort of on your planning board to write up some of this well, stuff? Or, this or is a, very... A, yeah, this is very, very much an ongoing project. I'm going to have to carry on doing interviews and there are a whole group of people who have said they're willing to be interviewed and have, are willing to talk to me about the South. So what we're planning to do is to do a whole series of papers, preferably published in the Heritage Portal. But we, I am also doing another talk about this for the Geo Heritage Conference in April. And I'm hoping to do some more talks about this later on. But there will be write up about this and the, the research will have to continue. I'm going to have to try and get into the newspaper articles at the Johannesburg Library as well. And like I said, I have got a whole lot of series of another interviews with people who've lived in the South. I love interviewing little old people in the South because they just want to talk. It's great. So if you do know any old little old men or little old ladies in the South of Joburg, I'd love to go and have coffee with them and listen to talk listen to them talk but, but having done all having done all this great work i mean it'd be dreadful for it not to get out there so i'm glad to hear you're going to publish it as well, well and and, I, and then two other questions um obviously you know we know go ahead your answer uh sorry i didn't hear okay. the question no no i'm getting i'm getting i'm getting it to it can you hear me i can hear you yes okay right Okay. Just, just interestingly, I mean, we know, you know, the extent to which the gold mines ended up using labor and, and our labor or workers. Obviously, most of them were black, um, yes. and and a lot of them ultimately were from, you know, the, the surrounding countries. But back in those early days of mining, where, where were those workers? I, and I say that with I can, respect, um, I, drawn I, from or they were. They, I'm going to share the screen of the tourist map again just so that I can show you. Um, but, but, but let me share the screen, share screen, share. All right, so again, I'm going to use my mouse pointers to show you. So some of the areas here, especially Regents Park, 
was mostly in mine managers' houses from about 1910 for the city and suburban deep, but also areas like, and I'm going to move across here, Boysons over here and Boysons Reserve were for Robinson Deep and Crown Mines. And then some of the areas in Turfentine and Kenilworth, which are, are down here, were used as mining houses, but they weren't mining houses in terms of sort of mine managers. It was the artisanal miners. So it would have been the fitters, the winders, the guys running the winding house, the guys building the furniture, the guys servicing and, 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 and building the cars. So there were mining areas and there were mining houses in the area, but most of those areas have been swallowed up. The biggest mining house area that we still retain, again, sorry for the use of the mouse, is up here on, in Crown Mines in this area around here. And you can see some of those original houses are still in the area, but they, they sort of, they look very similar to the ones that you can find in Turfentine. So in terms of the southern development, the mines mostly built their mining suburbs slightly north of the mines. There weren't very many built to the south. Most of the ones to the south were, like I said, the artisanal workers are the people who chose not to be part of those mining suburbs. Regents Park, Regents Park Extension, Rose Acre, and Clip Riversburg were part of a mining house complex. And the black workers, I mean, where did they come from? There's, were they just you, you, nomadic you can, tribes or? A lot, there, there is an article about it's just after well just in the middle of the Boer War about them a group of mine workers walking back because the railway lines were stopped and most of those guys came from Natal and you can see on this map you can see on the top right it says Eastern Native and that would have been the area where they were trying to keep the mine workers also in areas like um, the Workers Museum compound in in Johannesburg Central and there would have been those mine worker con compounds on the mines themselves these mine workers most of them like I said came from the, from Natal and during the the, the Boer war they couldn't get back and all the mines were closed so there was a a walk done where they walked back from Joburg back to Natal I will do a little bit more research on that and mention it in the next talk I do. Unfortunately, this one, I just, I ran out of time to cover anything. It was just, there's just so much information about the South of Joburg that isn't out there. And trying to condense it all into an hour is incredibly difficult. Yeah, sure, yeah, no, that's great stuff. And then my other, my other question, and then back to Henny and others, I mean, the, the, the uh, interesting you talk about the gardens and the nurseries and I've always been fascinated by the Brazilian pepper trees, which, which were obviously introduced. But yeah. if you go through the mines and particularly in the free state, you know, all the early mine officers had a, a Brazilian pepper tree or, or, or a few of them outside. Um, in, in any color or information on the on the Brazilian peppers? I actually have none. I'm going to have to phone Rue and ask him because he'll probably know. The one tree that I do know quite a lot about. Interesting. Within, okay, I'll leave that with you. Well, well, especially in the south of Joburg, one of the, the interesting sets of trees was the blue gums. And yeah. Forest, Forest, um, Forest Hill was called Forest Hill because there was a, a blue gum trans plantation in the area. And that was actually the red, the red blue gums. So that's why Forest Hill is called Forest Hill. No, but there I, I, were there were a lot of, of blue gum plantations in the area and you can actually see on this map here at the bottom this area with the, these trees this is where robertsham now sits and robertsham was also a part of a blue gum plantation and they were mainly planting them as mining supports yeah yeah well i mean you know blue gums aside from the fact that they're australian and certainly had some good uses as well <laughs> yes Yes. Kate Quiz Bosman says thank you for a super talk. Thank uh, you. you had to see when he saw the picture of your mum and dad way back, and he says get in touch with him because he's got an historic instrument that you maybe find of value for the museum. Well, if anyone yeah. does need to get hold of me, you can get, well, you can get my my email address and my phone number from Henny, and I'm very happy to hear from anyone. I just want to chirp in here, um, that wasn't a picture of me at all, <clears throat> I've deliberately kept out of pictures, but you, know, so you need to do some more talks on Pioneer Park and James Hall Museum of Transport. 
Okay. And old center Roma and things like that. Okay. Well, I, I, I can add quips about those because I know some of these. James Hall was originally part of the garden club and Rue told me a story about going and visiting him in his house. And he called, didn't call him James. Nobody called him James. Everyone called him Jimmy. And they used to go to the meetings of the garden club and then end up looking at all of the old, the old cars. And Rue, Rue's wife got very upset with him the one night because the garden club was meeting was supposed to end at 10 o'clock and they all got home at half past three in the morning because they'd been sitting playing around in the old cars. So there's a, an interesting historical quip about James Hall. But also Pioneer Park was named Pioneer Park because of the early pioneers to the area. And you can still visit it. We, we did have a look at it, but it, again, if I covered everything, I wouldn't cover anything. Um, another, famous, did... another famous place that's mentioned that you know, I visited myself comes from Stan Morris. He says that the Young family are still prominent in the area and Uncle Charlie, the Young, built the famous roadhouse. If you can remember, all guys remember yes. the Uncle Charlie's where everybody used to used to do as a reference point. A on the again, another historical clip about the Young family and Uncle Charlie. Apparently, one of Uncle Charlie's friends gifted him a lion cub, and Joan Thornton was telling me about this. Joan's mother had gone round for tea when this lion cub wandered into the parlor and sat down in the middle of the parlor and gave her a hell of a fright, but. The lion cub became part of the family and would roam the, 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 the gardens around Uncle Charlie's and Uncle Charlie's house, sort of like a dog or a cat would do. And quite often you'd, you'd find, and Noel told me this story, you'd find if you drove along that road sort of later in the evening, you'd find some, some of the people would be looking hitchhiking to look just to go around the, 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 the young house because they didn't want to walk past it because that's a lion da, that's a lion da, which I thought was rather, <laughs> rather fun. Well, on that very African note, I think we can, we, can, we can wrap up now. And as you saw, Kate, by the sheer weight of numbers, you must definitely give us another talk. Thank you very, I, I, very much. I will, if you will have me, and I would love to do it. Okay, guys, if there are no more questions, then thank you very much for attending. We we'll see you next week. Same time, not 10 o'clock, 10.30. Any words for a last word from you, John? No, Henry, you might just want to comment on the forthcoming gold presentation series. I think Neil, Neil Phillips has also been on the, the presentation. So there's a very interesting um, suite of talks coming, uh, driven by Neil and uh, Professor Alex Kisters from the University of Stellenbosch, um, a recent Draper awardee. Um, and we look forward to, and, and it's mostly, not all of it, we, we again have some Aussie influence, but it'll mostly be about the Barberton mountain land and, and, and the recent quite exciting work done there. Quick so word from you, Neil. Uh, well, first of all, Kate, thank you very much. I enjoyed that a lot and learned quite a bit about the other side of town. The only time I've ever been there actually is in a Nashua marathon when they took us all through the suburbs there. That was a while back. Um, next week, a series of five, that's five weeks in a row, sort of focusing on the overlap between gold mineralization, structural geology, alteration and fluids, trying to bring those together. And from my point of view, it's to highlight what I think is some great work that's being done um, on the Barberton mountain land geology and the gold mines there. Having been interested in those mines for many years now, a lot of the stuff that's come out recently is really world-class. And um, I think it's worth highlighting those and uh, bringing that to the fore. So uh, that starts next thanks, week. Yeah. yeah, thanks. Okay, thanks everyone. Great efforts. And thanks Henny again for your um, good um, management of the system. Okay, guys, we see you then next week, same time, same place. Have a good week.